Eric Hermanson's Soul, The Dramatic Story by Willa Cather. One, it was a great night at the Lone Star Schoolhouse, a night when the spirit was present with power and when God was very near to man. So it seemed to Asa Skinner, servant of God and free gospeler. The schoolhouse was crowded with the saved and sanctified, robust men and women, trembling and quailing before the power of some mysterious psychic force. Here and there among this cowering, sweating multitude crouched some poor wretch who had felt the pangs of an awakened conscience, but had not yet experienced that complete divestment of reason, that frenzy born of a convulsion of the mind, which, in the parlance of the free gospelers, is termed the light. On the floor before the mourner's bench lay the unconscious figure of a man in whom outraged nature had sought her last resort. This trance state is the highest evidence of grace among the free gospelers, and indicates a close walking with God. Before the desk stood Asa Skinner, shouting of the mercy and vengeance of God, and in his eyes shone a terrible earnestness, an almost prophetic flame. Asa was a converted train gambler who used to run between Omaha and Denver. He was a man made for the extremes of life. From the most debauched of men, he had become the most ascetic. His was a bastille face, a face that bore the stamp of nature's eternal injustice. The forehead was low, projecting over the eyes, and the sandy hair was plastered down over it and then brushed back at an abrupt right angle. The chin was heavy, the nostrils were low and wide, and the lower lip hung loosely except in his moments of spasmodic earnestness, when it shut like a steel trap. Yet about those coarse features there were deep, rugged furrows, the scars of many a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the weakness of the flesh and about that drooping lip were sharp, strenuous lines that had conquered it and taught it to pray. Over those seamed cheeks there was a certain pallor, a grayness caught from many a vigil. It was as though, after nature had done her worst with that face, some fine chisel had gone over it, chastening and almost transfiguring it. Tonight, as his muscles twitched with emotion, and the perspiration dropped from his hair and chin, there was a certain convincing power in the man. For Asa Skinner was a man possessed of a belief, of that sentiment of the sublime before which all inequalities are leveled, that transport of conviction which seems superior to all laws of condition, under which debauchees have become martyrs, which made a tinker an artist and a camel driver the founder of an empire. This was with Asa Skinner tonight, as he stood proclaiming the vengeance of God. It might have occurred to an impartial observer that Asa Skinner's God was indeed a vengeful God, if he could reserve vengeance for those of his creatures who were packed into the Lone Star schoolhouse that night, poor exiles of all nations, men from the South and the North, peasants from almost every country of Europe, most of them from the mountainous night-bound coast of Norway, honest men for the most part, but men with whom the world had dealt hardly, the failures of all countries, men sobered by toil and saddened by exile, who had been driven to fight for the dominion of an untoward soil, to sow where others should gather, the advance guard of a mighty civilization to be. Never had Asa Skinner spoken more earnestly than now. He felt that the Lord had this night a special work for him to do. Tonight Eric Hermanson, the wildest lad on all the divides sat in his audience with a fiddle on his knee, just as he had dropped in on his way to play for some dance. The violin is an object of particular abhorrence to the free gospelers. Their antagonism to the church organ is bitter enough, but the fiddle they regard as a very incarnation of evil desires, singing forever of worldly pleasures and inseparably associated with all forbidden things. Eric Hermanson had long been the object of the prayers of the revivalists. His mother had felt the power of the Spirit weeks ago, and special prayer meetings had been held at her house for her son. But Eric had only gone his ways laughing, the ways of youth, which are short enough at best, and none too flowery on the divide. 
he slipped away from the prayer meetings to meet the Campbell boys in Genero's saloon, or hug the plump little French girls at Chevalier's dances, and sometimes of a summer night he even went across the dewy cornfields and through the wild plum thicket to play the fiddle for Lena Hansen, whose name was a reproach through all the divide country, where the women are usually too plain and too busy and too tired to depart from the ways of virtue. On such occasions Lena, attired in a pink wrapper and silk stockings and tiny pink slippers, would sing to him, accompanying herself on a battered guitar. It gave him a delicious sense of freedom and experience to be with a woman who, no matter how, had lived in big cities and knew the ways of town folk, who had never worked in the fields and had kept her hands white and soft, her throat fair and tender who had heard great singers in Denver and Salt Lake, and who knew the strange language of flattery and idleness and mirth. Yet, careless as he seemed, the frantic prayers of his mother were not altogether without their effect upon Eric. For days he had been fleeing before them as a criminal from his pursuers, and over his pleasures had fallen the shadow of something dark and terrible that dogged his steps. The harder he danced, the louder he sang, the more was he conscious that this phantom was gaining upon him, that in time it would track him down. One Sunday afternoon, late in the fall, when he had been drinking beer with Lena Hansen and listening to a song which made his cheeks burn, a rattlesnake had crawled out of the side of the sod house and thrust its ugly head in under the screen door. He was not afraid of snakes but he knew enough of gospelism to feel the significance of the reptile lying coiled there upon her doorstep. His lips were cold when he kissed Lena goodbye, and he went there no more. The final barrier between Eric and his mother's faith was his violin, and to that he clung as a man sometimes will cling to his dearest sin, to the weakness more precious to him than all his strength. In the great world beauty comes to men in many guises, an art in a hundred forms. But for Eric, there was only his violin. It stood to him for all the manifestations of art. It was his only bridge into the kingdom of the soul. It was to Eric Hermanson that the evangelist directed his impassioned pleading that night. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is there a Saul here tonight who has stopped his ears to that gentle pleading? who has thrust a spear into that bleeding side? Think of it, my brother. You are offered this wonderful love, and you prefer the worm that dieth not, and the fire which will not be quenched. What right have you to lose one of God's precious souls? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? A great joy dawned in Asa Skinner's pale face, for he saw that Eric Hermanson was swaying to and fro in his seat, the minister fell upon his knees and threw his long arms up over his head. Oh, my brothers, I feel it coming. The blessing we have prayed for. I tell you the Spirit is coming. Just a little more prayer, brothers, a little more zeal, and he will be here. I can feel his cooling wing upon my brow. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. The whole congregation groaned under the pressure of this spiritual panic. Shouts and hallelujahs went up from every lip. Another figure fell prostrate upon the floor. From the mourner's bench rose a chant of terror and rapture. Eating honey and drinking wine, glory to the bleeding lamb. I am my Lord's, and he is mine, glory to the bleeding lamb. The hymn was sung in a dozen dialects and voiced all the vague yearning of these hungry lives of these people who had starved all the passions so long, only to fall victims to the basest of them all, fear. A groan of ultimate anguish rose from Eric Hermanson's bowed head, and the sound was like the groan of a great tree when it falls in the forest. The minister rose suddenly to his feet and threw back his head, crying in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Eric Hermanson, you are lost, going down at sea. In the name of God and Jesus Christ his Son, I throw you the lifeline. Take hold, Almighty God, my soul for his. The minister threw his arms out and lifted his quivering face. 
Eric Hermanson rose to his feet. His lips were set, and the lightning was in his eyes. He took his violin by the neck and crushed it to splinters across his knee, and to Asa Skinner the sound was like the shackles of sin broken audibly asunder. 2. For more than two years Eric Hermanson kept the austere faith to which he had sworn himself, kept it until a girl from the East came to spend a week on the Nebraska Divide. She was a girl of other manners and conditions, and there were greater distances between her life and Eric's than all the miles which separated Rattlesnake Creek from New York City. Indeed, she had no business to be in the West at all. But, ah, across what leagues of land and sea, by what improbable chances do the unrelenting gods bring to us our fate? It was in a year of financial depression that Wallace Elliott came to Nebraska to buy cheap land and revisit the country where he had spent a year of his youth. When he had graduated from Harvard, it was still customary for moneyed gentlemen to send their scapegrace sons to rough it on ranches in the wilds of Nebraska or Dakota, or to consign them to a living death in the sagebrush of the Black Hills. These young men did not always return to the ways of civilized life. But Wallace Elliott had not married a half-breed, nor been shot in a cowpuncher's brawl, nor wrecked by bad whiskey, nor appropriated by a smirched adventuress. He had been saved from these things by a girl, his sister, who had been very near to his life ever since the days when they read fairy tales together and dreamed the dreams that never come true. On this, his first visit to his father's ranch since he left it six years before, he brought her with him. She had been laid up half the winter from a sprain received while skating and had had too much time for reflection during those months. She was restless and filled with a desire to see something of the wild country of which her brother had told her so much. She was to be married the next winter, and Wallace understood her when she begged him to take her with him on this long, aimless jaunt across the continent to taste the last of their freedom together. It comes to all women of her type, that desire to taste the unknown which allures and terrifies, to run one's whole soul's length out to the wind, just once. It had been an eventful journey. Wallace somehow understood that strain of gypsy blood in his sister, and he knew where to take her. They had slept in sod houses on the Platte River, made the acquaintance of the personnel of a third-rate opera company on the train to Deadwood, dined in a camp of railroad constructors at the world's end beyond Newcastle, gone through the Black Hills on horseback, fished for trout in Dome Lake, watched a dance at Cripple Creek, where the lost souls who hide in the hills gathered for their besotted revelry. And now, last of all, before the return to thraldom, there was this little shack, anchored on the windy crest of the divide, a little black dot against the flaming sunsets, a scented sea of cornland bathed in opalescent air and blinding sunlight. Margaret Elliot was one of those women of whom there are so many in this day, when old order passing giveth place to new, beautiful, talented, critical, unsatisfied, tired of the world at twenty-four. For the moment the life and people of the divide interested her. She was there but a week, Perhaps had she stayed longer, that inexorable ennui which travels faster even than the vestibule limited would have overtaken her. The week she tarried there was the week that Eric Hermanson was helping Jerry Lockhart thresh. A week earlier or a week later, and there would have been no story to write. It was on Thursday, and they were to leave on Saturday. Wallace and his sister were sitting on the wide piazza of the ranch house, staring out into the afternoon sunlight and protesting against the gusts of hot wind that blew up from the sandy river bottom twenty miles to the southward. The young man pulled his cap lower over his eyes and remarked, This wind is the real thing. You don't strike it anywhere else. You remember we had a touch of it in Algiers, and I told you it came from Kansas. It's the keynote of this country. Wallace touched her hand that lay on the hammock and continued gently, I hope it's paid you, sis. Roughing it's dangerous business. It takes the taste out of things. 
she shut her fingers firmly over the brown hand that was so like her own. Paid? Why, Wireless, I haven't been so happy since we were children, and we're going to discover the ruins of Troy together some day. Do you know, I believe I could just stay on here forever and let the world go on its own gate. It seems as though the tension and strain we used to talk of last winter were gone for good, as though one could never give one's strength out to such petty things anymore. Wireless brushed the ashes of his pipe away from the silk handkerchief that was knotted about his neck and stared moodily off at the skyline. No, you're mistaken. This would bore you after a while. You can't shake the fever of the other life. I've tried it. There was a time when the gay fellows of Rome could trot down into the Thebaid and burrow into the sand hills and get rid of it. But it's all too complex now. You see, we've made our dissipations so dainty and respectable that they've gone further in than the flesh and taken hold of the ego proper. You couldn't rest, even here. The war cry would follow you. You don't waste words, Willis, but you never miss fire. I talk more than you do, without saying half so much. You must have learned the art of silence from these taciturn Norwegians. I think I like silent men. Naturally, said Wireless, since you have decided to marry the most brilliant talker you know. Both were silent for a time, listening to the sighing of the hot wind through the parched morning glory vines. Margaret spoke first. Tell me, Wallace, were many of the Norwegians you used to know as interesting as Eric Hermanson? Who, Siegfried? Well, no. He used to be the flower of the Norwegian youth in my day, and he's rather an exception even now. He has retrograded, though. The bonds of the soil have tightened on him, I fancy. Siegfried? Come, that's rather good, Wallace. He looks like a dragon slayer. What is it that makes him so different from the others? I can talk to him. He seems quite like a human being. Well, said Wireless meditatively, I don't read Bourget as much as my cultured sister, and I'm not so well up in analysis, but I fancy it's because one keeps cherishing a perfectly unwarranted suspicion that under that big, hulking anatomy of his, he may conceal a soul somewhere. Nicked war? Something like that, said Margaret thoughtfully, except that when it's a more than a suspicion and it isn't groundless. He has one and he makes it known somehow without speaking. I always have my doubts about loquacious souls, Wireless remarked, with the unbelieving smile that had grown habitual with him. Margaret went on, not heeding the interruption. I knew it from the first, when he told me about the suicide of his cousin, the Bernstein boy. That kind of blunt pathos can't be summoned at will in anybody. The earlier novelists rose to it, sometimes unconsciously. But last night, when I sang for him, I was doubly sure. Oh, I haven't told you about that yet. Better light your pipe again. You see, he stumbled in on me in the dark when I was pumping away at that old parlor organ to please Mrs. Lockhart. It's her household fetish, and I've forgotten how many pounds of butter she made and sold to buy it. Well, Eric stumbled in, and in some inarticulate manner made me understand that he wanted me to sing for him. I sang just the old things, of course. It's queer to sing familiar things here at the world's end. It makes one think how the hearts of men have carried them around the world, into the wastes of Iceland and the jungles of Africa and the islands of the Pacific. I think if one lived here long enough, one would quite forget how to be trivial, and would read only the great books that we never get time to read in the world, and would remember only the great music, and the things that are really worthwhile would stand out clearly against that horizon over there. And of course, I played the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana for him. It goes rather better on an organ than most things do. He shuffled his feet and twisted his big hands up into knots and blurted out that he didn't know there was any music like that in the world, why there were tears in his voice. Wallace, yes, like Rossetti, I heard his tears. 
Then it dawned upon me that it was probably the first good music he had ever heard in all his life. Think of it to care for music as he does, and never to hear it, never to know that it exists on earth, to long for it as we long for other perfect experiences that never come. I can't tell you what music means to that man. I never saw anyone so susceptible to it. It gave him speech. He became alive. When I had finished the intermezzo, he began telling me about a little crippled brother who died and whom he loved and used to carry everywhere in his arms. He did not wait for encouragement. He took up the story and told it slowly as if to himself, just sort of rose up and told his own woe to answer Mascani's. It overcame me. Poor devil, said Wireless, looking at her with mysterious eyes. And so you've given him a new woe. Now he'll go on wanting Grieg and Schubert the rest of his days and never getting them. That's a girl's philanthropy for you. Jerry Lockhart came out of the house screwing his chin over the unusual luxury of a stiff white collar, which his wife insisted upon as a necessary article of toilet while Miss Elliot was at the house. Jerry sat down on the step and smiled his broad red smile at Margaret. Well, I've got the music for your dance, Miss Elliot. Olaf Olison will bring his accordion and Molly will play the organ when she isn't looking after the grub and a little chap from Frenchtown will bring his fiddle, though the French don't mix with the Norwegians much. Delightful. Mr. Lockhart, that dance will be the feature of our trip, and it's so nice of you to get it up for us. We'll see the Norwegians in character at last, cried Margaret cordially. See here, Lockhart, I'll settle with you for backing her in this scheme, said Wireless, sitting up and knocking the ashes out of his pipe. She's done crazy things enough on this trip, but to talk of dancing all night with a gang of half-mad Norwegians and taking the carriage at four to catch the six o'clock train out of Riverton, well, it's Tommy Rot, that's what it is. Wallace, I leave it to your sovereign power of reason to decide whether it isn't easier to stay up all night than to get up at three in the morning. To get up at three, think what that means. No, sir, I prefer to keep my vigil and then get into a sleeper. But what do you want with the Norwegians? I thought you were tired of dancing. So I am, with some people. But I want to see a Norwegian dance, and I intend to. Come, Wallace, you know how seldom it is that one really wants to do anything nowadays. I wonder when I have really wanted to go to a party before. It will be something to remember next month at Newport when we have to and don't want to. Remember your own theory that contrast is about the only thing that makes life endurable. This is my party and Mr. Lockhart's. Your whole duty tomorrow night will consist in being nice to the Norwegian girls. I'll warrant you were adept enough at it once. And you'd better be very nice indeed, for if there are many such young Valkyrs as Eric's sister among them, they would simply tie you up in a knot if they suspected you were guying them. Wallace groaned and sank back into the hammock to consider his fate while his sister went on. And the guests, Mr. Lockhart, did they accept? Lockhart took out his knife and began sharpening it on the sole of his plowshoe. Well, I guess we'll have a couple dozen. You see, it's pretty hard to get a crowd together here anymore. Most of them have gone over to the free gospelers, and they'd rather put their feet in the fire than shake them to a fiddle. Margaret made a gesture of impatience. Those free gospelers have just cast an evil spell over this country, haven't they? Well, said Lockhart cautiously, I don't just like to pass judgment on any Christian sect, but if you're to know the chosen by their works, the gospelers can't make a very proud showing, and that's a fact. They're responsible for a few suicides, and they've sent a good-sized delegation to the state insane asylum, and I don't see as they've made the rest of us much better than we were before. I had a little herd boy last spring, as square a little Dane as I want to work for me, but after the gospelers got hold of him and sanctified him, the little beggar used to get down on his knees out on the prairie and pray by the hour and let the cattle get into the corn, and I had to fire him. 
that's about the way it goes. Now there's Eric. That chap used to be a hustler and the spryest dancer in all this section, called all the dances. Now he's got no ambition and he's glum as a preacher. I don't suppose we can even get him to come in tomorrow night. Um, Eric? Why, he must dance. We can't let him off, said Margaret quickly. Why, I intend to dance with him myself. I'm afraid he won't dance. I asked him this morning if he'd help us out, um, and he said, I don't dance now anymore, said Lockhart, imitating the labored English of the Norwegian. The Miller of Hofbau, the Miller of Hofbau, oh, my princess, chirped Wyllis cheerfully from his hammock. The red on his sister's cheek deepened a little, and she laughed mischievously. We'll see about that, sir. I'll not admit that I am beaten until I have asked him myself. Every night Eric rode over to St. Anne, a little village in the heart of the French settlement for the mail. As the road lay through the most attractive part of the Divide country, on several occasions Margaret Elliot and her brother had accompanied him. Tonight Wallace had business with Lockhart, and Margaret rode with Eric, mounted on a frisky little Mustang that Mrs. Lockhart had broken to the side saddle. Margaret regarded her escort very much as she did the servant who always accompanied her on long rides at home, and the ride to the village was a silent one. She was occupied with thoughts of another world, and Eric was wrestling with more thoughts than had ever been crowded into his head before. He rode with his eyes riveted on that slight figure before him, as though he wished to absorb it through the optic nerves and hold it in his brain forever. He understood the situation perfectly. His brain worked slowly, but he had a keen sense of the values of things. This girl represented an entirely new species of humanity to him, but he knew where to place her. The prophets of old, when an angel first appeared unto them, never doubted its high origin. Eric was patient under the adverse conditions of his life, but he was not servile. The Norse blood in him had not entirely lost its self-reliance. He came of a proud fisher line, men who were not afraid of anything but the ice and the devil, and he had prospects before him when his father went down off the North Cape in the long Arctic night, and his mother, seized by a violent horror of seafaring life, had followed her brother to America. Eric was eighteen then, handsome as young Siegfried, a giant in stature with a skin singularly pure and delicate, like a Swede's, hair as yellow as the locks of Tennyson's amorous prince, and eyes of a fierce, burning blue, whose flash was most dangerous to women. He had in those days a certain pride of bearing, a certain confidence of approach that usually accompanies physical perfection. It was even said of him then that he was in love with life and inclined to levity, a vice most unusual on the divide. But the sad history of those Norwegian exiles, transplanted in an arid soil and under a scorching sun, had repeated itself in his case. Toil and isolation had sobered him, and he grew more and more like the clods among which he labored. It was as though some red-hot instrument had touched for a moment those delicate fibers of the brain which respond to acute pain or pleasure in which lies the power of exquisite sensation, and had seared them quite away. It is a painful thing to watch the light die out of the eyes of those Norsemen, leaving an expression of impenetrable sadness, quite passive, quite hopeless, a shadow that is never lifted. With some this change comes almost at once, in the first bitterness of homesickness. With others it comes more slowly according to the time it takes each man's heart to die. Oh, those poor Northmen of the Divide! They are dead many a year before they are put to rest in the little graveyard on the windy hill where exiles of all nations grow akin. The peculiar species of hypochondria to which the exiles of his people sooner or later succumb had not developed in Eric until that night at the Lone Star schoolhouse when he had broken his violin across his knee. After that the gloom of his people settled down upon him and the gospel of maceration began its work. 
If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, etc. The pagan smile that once hovered about his lips was gone, and he was one with sorrow. Religion heals a hundred hearts for one that it embitters, but when it destroys, its work is quick and deadly, and where the agony of the cross has been, joy will not come again. This man understood things literally. One must live without pleasure to die without fear. To save the soul, it was necessary to starve the soul. The sun hung low above the cornfields when Margaret and her cavalier left St. Anne. South of the town, there is a stretch of road that runs for some three miles through the French settlement, where the prairie is as level as the surface of a lake. There, the fields of flax and wheat and rye are bordered by precise rows of slender, tapering Lombard poplars. It was a yellow world that Margaret Elliot saw under the wide light of the setting sun. The girl gathered up her reins and called back to Eric. It will be safe to run the horses here, won't it? Yes, I think so now, he answered, touching his spur to his pony's flank. They were off like the wind. It is an old saying in the West that newcomers always ride a horse or two to death before they get broken into the country. They are tempted by the great open spaces and try to outride the horizon to get to the end of something. Margaret galloped over the level road, and Eric from behind saw her long veil fluttering in the wind. It had fluttered just so in his dreams last night and the night before. With a sudden inspiration of courage, he overtook her and rode beside her, looking intently at her half-averted face. Before, he had only stolen occasional glances at it, seen it in blinding flashes, always with more or less embarrassment, but now he determined to let every line of it sink into his memory. Men of the world would have said that it was an unusual face, nervous, finely cut, with clear, elegant lines that betokened ancestry. Men of letters would have called it a historic face, and would have conjectured at what old passions, long asleep, what old sorrows forgotten time out of mind, doing battle together in ages gone, had curved those delicate nostrils, left their unconscious memory in those eyes. But Eric read no meaning in these details. To him, this beauty was something more than color and line. It was as a flash of white light, in which one cannot distinguish color because all colors are there. To him, it was a complete revelation, an embodiment of those dreams of impossible loveliness that linger by a young man's pillow on midsummer nights. Yet because it held something more than the attraction of health and youth and shapeliness, it troubled him, and in its presence he felt as the Goths before the white marbles in the Roman capital, not knowing whether they were men or gods. At times he felt like uncovering his head before it, Again the fury seized him to break and despoil, to find the clay in this spirit thing and stamp upon it. Away from her, he longed to strike out with his arms and take and hold. It maddened him that this woman whom he could break in his hands should be so much stronger than he. But near her, he never questioned this strength. He admitted its potentiality as he admitted the miracles of the Bible. It enervated and conquered him. Tonight, when he rode so close to her that he could have touched her, he knew that he might as well reach out his hand to take a star. Margaret stirred uneasily under his gaze and turned questioningly in her saddle. This wind puts me a little out of breath when we ride fast, she said. Eric turned his eyes away. I want to ask you if I go to New York to work. If I maybe hear music like you sang last night, I've been a pretty good hand to work, he asked timidly. Margaret looked at him with surprise, and then as she studied the outline of his face, pityingly, well, you might, but you'd lose a good deal else. I shouldn't like you to go to New York and be poor. You'd be out of atmosphere some way, she said slowly. Inwardly, she was thinking, there he would be altogether sordid, impossible a machine who would carry one's trunks upstairs, perhaps. Here he is every inch a man, rather picturesque. Why is it? No, she added aloud. I shouldn't like that. 
Then I not go, said Eric decidedly. Margaret turned her face to hide a smile. She was a trifle amused and a trifle annoyed. Suddenly she spoke again. But I'll tell you what I do want you to do, Eric. I want you to dance with us tomorrow night and teach me some of the Norwegian dances. They say you know them all, won't you? Eric straightened himself in his saddle, and his eyes flashed as they had done in the Lone Star schoolhouse when he broke his violin across his knee. Yes, I will, he said quietly, and he believed that he delivered his soul to hell as he said it. They had reached the rougher country now, where the road wound through a narrow cut in one of the bluffs along the creek, when a beat of hooves ahead and the sharp neighing of horses made the ponies start and Eric rose in his stirrups. Then down the gulch in front of them and over the steep clay banks thundered a herd of wild ponies, nimble as monkeys and wild as rabbits, such as horse traders drive east from the plains of Montana to sell in the farming country. Margaret's pony made a shrill sound, a neigh that was almost a scream, and started up the clay bank to meet them, all the wild blood of the range breaking out in an instant. Margaret called to Eric just as he threw himself out of the saddle and caught her pony's bit. But the wiry little animal had gone mad and was kicking and biting like a devil. Her wild brothers of the range were all about her, neighing and pawing the earth, and striking her with their forefeet and snapping at her flanks. It was the old liberty of the range that the little beast fought for. Drop the reins and hold tight, tight, Eric called, throwing all his weight upon the bit, struggling under those frantic four feet that now beat at his breast, and now kicked at the wild mustangs that surged and tossed about him. He succeeded in wrenching the pony's head toward him and crowding her withers against the clay bank so that she could not roll. Hold tight, tight he shouted again, launching a kick at a snorting animal that reared back against Margaret's saddle. If she should lose her courage and fall now, under those hoofs, he struck out again and again, kicking right and left with all his might. Already the negligent drivers had galloped into the cut, and their long quirts were whistling over the heads of the herd. As suddenly as it had come, the struggling, frantic wave of wildlife swept up out of the gulch and on across the open prairie, and with a long, despairing whinny of farewell, the pony dropped her head and stood trembling in her sweat, shaking the foam and blood from her bit. Eric stepped close to Margaret's side and laid his hand on her saddle. "'You are not hurt?' he asked hoarsely. As he raised his face in the soft starlight, she saw that it was white and drawn and that his lips were working nervously. No, no, not at all. But you, you are suffering. They struck you, she cried in sharp alarm. He stepped back and drew his hand across his brow. No, it is not that. He spoke rapidly now, with his hands clenched at his side. But if they had hurt you, I would beat their brains out with my hands. I would kill them all. I was never afraid before. You are the only beautiful thing that has ever come close to me. You came like an angel out of the sky. You are like the music you sing. You are like the stars and the snow on the mountains where I played when I was a little boy. You are like all that I wanted once and never had. You are all that they have killed in me. I die for you tonight, tomorrow, for all eternity. I am not a coward. I was afraid because I love you more than Christ who died for me, more than I am afraid of hell or hope for heaven. I was never afraid before. If you had fallen, oh my God. He threw his arms out blindly and dropped his head upon the pony's mane, leaning limply against the animal like a man struck by some sickness. His shoulders rose and fell perceptibly with his labored breathing. The horse stood cowed with exhaustion and fear. Presently Margaret laid her hand on Eric's head and said gently, You are better now. Shall we go on? Can you get your horse? No, he has gone with the herd. I will lead yours. She is not safe. I will not frighten you again. His voice was still husky, but it was steady now. He took hold of the bit and tramped home in silence. 
When they reached the house, Eric stood stolidly by the pony's head until Wallace came to lift his sister from the saddle. The horses were badly frightened, Willis. I think I was pretty thoroughly scared myself, she said as she took her brother's arm and went slowly up the hill toward the house. No, I'm not hurt, thanks to Eric. You must thank him for taking such good care of me. He's a mighty fine fellow. I'll tell you all about it in the morning, dear. I was pretty well shaken up, and I'm going right to bed now. Good night. When she reached the low room in which she slept, she sank upon the bed in her riding dress face downward. Oh, I pity him. I pity him, she murmured with a long sigh of exhaustion. She must have slept a little. When she rose again, she took from her dress a letter that had been waiting for her at the village post office. It was closely written in a long, angular hand, covering a dozen pages of foreign note paper, and began... My dearest Margaret, if I should attempt to say how like a winter hath thine absence been, I should incur the risk of being tedious. Really, it takes the sparkle out of everything. Having nothing better to do and not caring to go anywhere in particular without you, I remained in the city until Jack Courtwell noted my general despondency and brought me down here to his place onto the sound to manage some open-air theatricals he is getting up. As You Like It is, of course, the piece selected. Miss Harrison plays Rosalind. I wish you had been here to take the part. Miss Harrison reads her lines well, but she is either a maiden all forlorn or a tomboy. Insists on reading into the part all sorts of deeper meanings and highly colored suggestions wholly out of harmony with the pastoral setting. Like most of the professionals, she exaggerates the emotional element and quite fails to do justice to Rosalind's facile wit and really brilliant mental qualities. Gerard will do Orlando, but rumor says he is Epris of your sometime friend, Miss Meredith, and his memory is treacherous and his interest fitful. My new pictures arrived last week on the Gascogne. The Puvis de Chavon is even more beautiful than I thought it in Paris. A pale dream maiden sits by a pale dream cow, and a stream of anemic water flows at her feet. The constant, you will remember, I got because you admired it. It is here in all its florid splendor, the whole dominated by a glowing sensuosity. The drapery of the female figure is as wonderful as you said, the fabric all barbaric pearl and gold, painted with an easy, effortless voluptuousness, and that white, gleaming line of African coast in the background recalls memories of you very precious to me. But it is useless to deny that Constant irritates me. Though I cannot prove the charge against him, his brilliancy always makes me suspect him of cheapness. Here Margaret stopped and glanced at the remaining pages of this strange love letter. They seemed to be filled chiefly with discussions of pictures and books and with a slow smile she laid them by. She rose and began undressing. Before she lay down, she went to open the window. With her hand on the sill, she hesitated, feeling suddenly as though some danger were lurking outside, some inordinate desire waiting to spring upon her in the darkness. She stood there for a long time, gazing at the infinite sweep of the sky. Oh, it is all so little, so little there she murmured. When everything else is so dwarfed, why should one expect love to be great? Why should one try to read highly colored suggestions into a life like that? If only I could find one thing in it all that mattered greatly, one thing that would warm me when I am alone. Will life never give me that one great moment? As she raised the window, she heard a sound in the plum bushes outside. It was only the house dog roused from his sleep, but Margaret started violently and trembled, so that she caught the foot of the bed for support. Again she felt herself pursued by some overwhelming longing, some desperate necessity for herself, like the outstretching of helpless, unseen arms in the darkness, and the air seemed heavy with sighs of yearning. She fled to her bed with the words, I love you more than Christ, who died for me 
ringing in her ears. Three. About midnight, the dance at Lockhart's was at its height. Even the old man who had come to look on caught the spirit of revelry and stamped the floor with the vigor of old Salinas. Eric took the violin from the Frenchman, and Minna Olison sat at the organ, and the music grew more and more characteristic, rude, half-mournful music, made up of the folk songs of the North, that the villagers sing through the long night in hamlets by the sea, when they are thinking of the sun and the spring, and the fishermen so long away. To Margaret some of it sounded like Grieg's Pyre Gint music, she found something irresistibly infectious in the mirth of these people who were so seldom merry, and she felt almost one of them. Something seemed struggling for freedom in them tonight, something of the joyous childhood of the nations which exile had not killed. The girls were all boisterous with delight. Pleasure came to them, but rarely, and when it came, they caught at it wildly and crushed its fluttering wings in their strong brown fingers. They had a hard life enough, most of them. Torrid summers and freezing winters, labor and drudgery and ignorance, were the portion of their girlhood. A short wooing, a hasty loveless marriage, unlimited maternity, thankless sons, premature age and ugliness, were the dower of their womanhood. But what matter? Tonight there was hot liquor in the glass and hot blood in the heart. Tonight they danced. Tonight Eric Hermanson had renewed his youth. He was no longer the big, silent Norwegian who had sat at Margaret's feet and looked hopelessly into her eyes. Tonight he was a man, with a man's rights and a man's power. Tonight he was Siegfried indeed. His hair was yellow as the heavy wheat in the ripe of summer and his eyes flashed like the blue water between the ice packs and the North Seas. He was not afraid of Margaret tonight, and when he danced with her he held her firmly. She was tired and dragged on his arm a little, but the strength of the man was like an all-pervading fluid, stealing through her veins, awakening under her heart some nameless, unsuspected existence that had slumbered there all these years, and that went out through her throbbing fingertips to his that answered. She wondered if the hoydenish blood of some lawless ancestor long asleep were calling out in her tonight, some drop of a hotter fluid that the centuries had failed to cool, and why, if this curse were in her, it had not spoken before. But was it a curse? This awakening? This wealth before undiscovered? This music set free? For the first time in her life her heart held something stronger than herself. Was not this worth while? Then she ceased to wonder. She lost sight of the lights and the faces, and the music was drowned by the beating of her own arteries. She saw only the blue eyes that flashed above her, felt only the warmth of that throbbing hand which held hers and which the blood of his heart fed. Dimly as in a dream she saw the drooping shoulders, high white forehead, and tight cynical mouth of the man she was to marry in December. For an hour she had been crowding back the memory of that face with all her strength. Let us stop. This is enough, she whispered. His only answer was to tighten the arm behind her. She sighed and let that masterful strength bear her where it would. She forgot that this man was little more than a savage, that they would part at dawn. The blood has no memories, no reflections, no regrets for the past, no consideration of the future. Let us go out where it is cooler, she said when the music stopped, thinking, I am growing faint here, I shall be all right in the open air. They stepped out into the cool blue air of the night. Since the older folk had begun dancing, the young Norwegians had been slipping out in couples to climb the windmill tower into the cooler atmosphere as is their custom. "'You like to go up?' asked Eric, close to her ear. She turned and looked at him with suppressed amusement. "'How high is it? Forty feet, about. I not let you fall.' There was a note of irresistible pleading in his voice, and she felt that he tremendously wished her to go. "'Well, why not? This was a night of the unusual when she was not herself at all, but was living an unreality. 
Tomorrow, yes, in a few hours, there would be the Vestibule Limited and the world. Well, if you'll take good care of me, I used to be able to climb when I was a little girl. Once at the top and seated on the platform, they were silent. Margaret wondered if she would not hunger for that scene all her life, through all the routine of the days to come. Above them stretched the great western sky, serenely blue even in the night with its big burning stars, never so cold and dead and far away as in denser atmospheres. The moon would not be up for twenty minutes yet, and all about the horizon, that wide horizon which seemed to reach around the world, lingered a pale white light as of a universal dawn. The weary wind brought up to them the heavy odors of the cornfields. The music of the dance sounded faintly from below. Eric leaned on his elbow beside her, his legs swinging down on the ladder. His great shoulders looked more than ever like those of the stone Doriferous, who stands in his perfect, reposeful strength in the Louvre, and had often made her wonder if such men died forever with the youth of Greece. How sweet the corn smells at night, said Margaret nervously. Yes, like the flowers that grow in paradise, I think. She was somewhat startled by this reply, and more startled when this taciturn man spoke again. You go away tomorrow? Yes, we have stayed longer than we thought to now. You not come back any more? No, I expect not. You see, it is a long trip, halfway across the continent. You soon forget about this country, I guess. It seemed to him now a little thing to lose his soul for this woman, but that she should utterly forget this night into which he threw all his life and all his eternity. That was a bitter thought. No, Eric, I will not forget. You have all been too kind to me for that, and you won't be sorry you danced this one night, will you? I never be sorry. I have not been so happy before. I not be so happy again, ever. You will be happy many nights yet, I only this one. I will dream sometimes, maybe. The mighty resignation of his tone alarmed and touched her. It was as when some great animal composes itself for death, as when a great ship goes down at sea. She sighed but did not answer him. He drew a little closer and looked into her eyes. You are not always happy, too? he asked. No, not always, Eric. Not very often, I think. You have a trouble? Yes, but I cannot put it into words. Perhaps if I could do that, I could cure it. He clasped his hands together over his heart, as children do when they pray, and said falteringly, If I own all the world, I give him you. Margaret felt a sudden moisture in her eyes and laid her hand on his. Thank you, Eric. I believe you would. But perhaps even then I should not be happy. Perhaps I have too much of it already. She did not take her hand away from him. She did not dare. She sat still and waited for the traditions in which she had always believed to speak and save her, but they were dumb. She belonged to an ultra-refined civilization which tries to cheat nature with elegant sophistries. Cheat nature? Bah! One generation may do it, perhaps two, but the third? Can we ever rise above nature or sink below her? Did she not turn on Jerusalem as upon Sodom? upon St. Anthony in his desert as upon Nero in his seraglio? Does she not always cry in brutal triumph? I am here still, at the bottom of things, warming the roots of life. You cannot starve me, nor tame me, nor thwart me. I made the world, I rule it, and I am its destiny. This woman, on a windmill tower at the world's end with a giant barbarian, heard that cry tonight, and she was afraid. Ah, the terror and the delight of that moment when first we fear ourselves. Until then we have not lived. Come, Eric, let us go down. The moon is up, and the music has begun again, she said. He rose silently and stepped down upon the ladder, putting his arm about her to help her. That arm could have thrown Thor's hammer out in the cornfields yonder, yet it scarcely touched her, 
and his hand trembled as it had done in the dance. His face was level with hers now, and the moonlight fell sharply upon it. All her life she had searched the faces of men for the look that lay in his eyes. She knew that that look had never shone for her before, would never shine for her on earth again, that such love comes to one only in dreams or in impossible places like this, unattainable always. This was love's self. In a moment it would die. Stung by the agonized appeal that emanated from the man's whole being, she leaned forward and laid her lips on his. Once, twice, and again she heard the deep respirations rattle in his throat while she held them there, and the riotous force under her heart became an engulfing weakness. He drew her up to him until he felt all the resistance go out of her body, until every nerve relaxed and yielded. When she drew her face back from his, it was white with fear. "'Let us go down, oh my God, let us go down,' she muttered. And the drunken stars up yonder seemed reeling to some appointed doom as she clung to the rounds of the ladder. All that she was to know of love she had left upon his lips. "'The devil is loose again,' whispered Olaf Olesen, as he saw Eric dancing a moment later, his eyes blazing. But Eric was thinking with an almost savage exultation of the time when he should pay for this. Ah, there would be no quailing then. If ever a soul went fearlessly, proudly down to the gates infernal, his should go. For a moment he fancied he was there already, treading down the tempest of flame, hugging the fiery hurricane to his breast. He wondered whether in ages gone, all the countless years of sinning in which men had sold and lost and flung their souls away, any man had ever so cheated Satan, had ever bartered his soul for so great a price. It seemed but a little while till dawn. The carriage was brought to the door, and Wallace Elliot and his sister said goodbye. She could not meet Eric's eyes as she gave him her hand, but as he stood by the horse's head, just as the carriage moved off, she gave him one swift glance that said, I will not forget. In a moment the carriage was gone. Eric changed his coat and plunged his head into the water tank and went to the barn to hook up his team. As he led his horses to the door, a shadow fell across his path, and he saw Skinner rising in his stirrups. His rugged face was pale and worn with looking after his wayward flock, with dragging men into the way of salvation. "'Good morning, Eric. There was a dance here last night?' he asked sternly. "'A dance? Oh, yes, a dance,' replied Eric cheerfully. "'Certainly you did not dance, Eric?' "'Yes, I danced. I danced all the time.' The minister's shoulders drooped, and an expression of profound discouragement settled over his haggard face. There was almost anguish in the yearning he felt for this soul." Eric, I didn't look for this from you. I thought God had set his mark on you if he ever had on any man. And it is for things like this that you set your soul back a thousand years from God, O oh, foolish and perverse generation. Eric drew himself up to his full height and looked off to where the new day was gilding the corn tassels and flooding the uplands with light. As his nostrils drew in the breath of the dew and the morning, Something from the only poetry he had ever read flashed across his mind, and he murmured half to himself with dreamy exultation, And a day shall be as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day.